morning we bring to you experts and professionals and friends in their particular categories. Our moderator will begin by allowing the persons to introduce themselves. A minute or two. She, she's, she's the one. She's in charge. <laughs> and um, will uh, begin to dialogue with us. Please, no food, uh, I think water, if you bring water in, and I'm not telling you to bring water in because the signs say no food or drink, but if you do, bring it out with you, okay. Uh, the bathrooms are outside, and you know, uh, please silence your phones and uh, or put them on a, a vibrating mode. Please fill out the questionnaire that you will receive at the close of this event or at the close of the time that you're standing. We want to thank Mr. Bowie, always. Channel 10, I think, is here. Three, all of the stations, we thank you for being here. Uh, Mr. Bowie, for always airing us on AOC. We appreciate you and your commitment to the community. We are grateful to Maison de Williams, Cheryl Williams, owner and operator, school board member Elroy Broussard, Mid-South Bank, Iberia Bank, Atmos Energy, and all of our supporters at SMILE for supporting with refreshments and other items for this particular event. We want to thank the persons that said yes to join us here today, and we thank you in a special way. Let's begin with our moderator, Margaret Chonghaw, the CEO and president of the United Way of Acadiana. She is an educator, she is a panelist, she coordinator, she's a moderator, she is a lot of things that are good for our community and we're happy that she has partnered and agreed with us to come here. And of course, we will start with education, particularly in no order, Dr. Wayne Bowie, Dwayne Bowie, Dr. Willie Smith, Superintendent Dr. Lottie Beebe, and Ms. Margaret Tromhall will come in her own way as we begin. Thank you. Thank you, Gilda. Um, good morning, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules to be a uh, part of this important conversation this morning. We're very fortunate to have this distinguished set of panelists and um, as Hilda has instructed, we're going to let them do a quick introduction. Um, and we'll start here on, um, on my left, your right, uh, Dr. Willie Smith. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Dr. Willie E. Smith, I'm the Vice Chancellor of South Louisiana Community College, the Vice Chancellor of Community and Work with the also serving as the Vice Chancellor of Inner Vice Chancellor of Academic Affairs. Thank you for allowing me to join me. Good morning, and certainly I want to thank the facilitators for inviting me to be a part of this important dialogue. I think it's very much needed. I am the superintendent of the St. Martin Parish School System, a former BSE member. I served uh, four years on the State Board of Elementary and Secondary Education, and I am a stranger to poverty, but because of education, I was able to overcome this challenge. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Dwayne Bowie. I'm the Vice President for Enrollment Management at the University of Louisiana Lafayette. I've uh, been there for 26 years now in higher education uh, as Enrollment Manager. Uh, my main responsibilities are to recruit students to our campus, uh, but the big part of that is making sure they're successful while they're there and they're graduating in four years. So uh, this is definitely a timely conversation we're having about poverty and education and, and the importance of the two working together. I do want to do one plug. Uh, I was actually a community action employee back in my days when I was like 19, 20 years old. Back in my hometown, back in Jonesboro Heart of North Louisiana. So it's good to be a part of this dialogue today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Chandler. All right, we have uh, about, about 25 minutes to really dig into three questions. We've got three experts, all of whom know a lot. So I'm going to ask each of you to take, for the first question, about three minutes. You don't have to take it full time. But this, this, this is the question. And that is that research suggests that as educational attainment goes up, a person's lifetime income also increases. Um, high school graduates 
uh, on average, earn about $10,000 more per year than a high school dropout. And over their lifetime, college graduates earn roughly $1 million more than a high school dropout. Thus, many people say that education is the key uh, to getting out of poverty. So what is your take on this? And I guess, uh, Willie, since you have the microphone, we'll let you get started. I guess I'll be the first to get into the first Let me say, uh, first of all, basically speak about myself and to show roughly over the, the level of someone attainment and graduation, uh, excuse me, attainment or getting college degree that you earn a million dollars more. And I couldn't say that uh, more than what this statement has already said. However, I would say that we know in many state and across our country now that you need more than a high school diploma to be successful. So sometimes before I did it for you, but probably two years more than a high school diploma or social degree. And the earning and test potential, meaning that you go from a high school graduate to someone with a social degree, you're going to make two times more. You get a bachelor's degree, you're going to make four times more. And so the question, as I say, speak for itself. But let me tell you how valuable education is. It just don't influence your earnings, it influences your health care. Because the more money you make, the more opportunity you have to have health insurance, pension insurance, that many times people in poverty probably don't have the luxury. Uh, also, education, those education adults are more active in community activism, different issues that go on in the community. So you have a say on how your education institutions run, you have a say on how your local government operates. You have a say on how the state government operates. So the more you're educated, the more you can find an opportunity of being successful in a kind of Let me talk about a few other things you are able to do that you may not know. Uh, 
partner with the business community as we have in St. Martin Parish uh, to uh, promote <coughs> excellence, to uh, reward teachers, to recognize their efforts, to, re uh, to recognize our students' efforts. And uh, so, uh, yes, education is the key to overcoming poverty. And I, I also have statistics. When we look at Louisiana, my, my stats say that uh, we are second in the nation following Mississippi. And uh, we have more children uh, that live in poverty. In fact, 31% of Louisiana's children live in poverty. 10% uh, of the babies born in Louisiana are low birth weight, the second highest in the nation, and the highest in the South. You know, children come to us disadvantaged, and I will say uh, that within the public school systems, we turn away no child. Uh, we have many students in foster care. Uh, in fact, uh, it's increased by 70% since uh, 2002. 35% uh, of children in Louisiana live with parents <coughs> who do not have full uh, year-round jobs. So poverty, those children of poverty, they come to us uh, with disadvantages. And I think education, I guess to, to, to uh, summarize, uh, education is the equalizer, <coughs> but it's not the only thing. We have to work together to ensure that we encourage children to have that work ethic, to uh, have that, to provide that guidance, that support, that nurturing. Uh, we need to assist, just as my teachers and others nurtured me and encouraged me to pursue education. And Dr. Bowie, you're at the other end of the cycle. Thank you. You're at the other end of the sort of the educational pipeline. You're receiving people who have, in fact, graduated from high school, and they're uh, going into the university. And so for them, I guess the, the, they, they can see the light at the end of the tunnel, so to speak. So talk a little bit about um, your view on um, the relationship between poverty and maybe higher ed. Be happy to. Um, and actually, uh, I can speak from a personal perspective as well. Uh, because I grew up, I guess, in poverty as well. We look at the income of my family. My mom was separated from my dad. When I look at income, we would have fell below the poverty rate. Uh, but we didn't, we didn't know we were in that situation. Uh, a lot of my friends were that way as well. And so uh, we, we had a lot of love at home. That's one thing that we did, a close-knit family. Uh, we did have food on the table every day. It wasn't McDonald's or Burger King, but it was a good homemade meal with vegetables and things of that nature. And we felt loved and we were supported and encouraged to edu get educated. And we didn't feel as if we were in a, a, a disadvantaged situation. Although when I look back on the stats, we actually were. Uh, what I see every day at the University of Lafayette is a lot of students coming to our campus who are actually first generation <coughs> students. So these are students whose parents have no college education, many no college experience or exposure whatsoever. So we see these students coming to our campus at a big disadvantage. Because one, they don't have that support from home from someone that can guide and direct them to help them to navigate a college campus, which is very difficult uh, at many, many times. But I do see education as well, and I talk to students about this all the time. You know, the quickest way for you to get to a sustainable place where you can maintain a middle uh, income level uh, status is education and higher education. And when I say education, I'm talking about post-secondary education, education beyond uh, the high school level. It could be technical education, it could be community college education, it could be a four-year degree as well. All three can help you to get there and help you to get there in a sustainable way. There is no get-rich-quick scheme out there that, that I want our kids to take advantage of. Uh, what I see often as well on my campus is we have uh, Division I athletics. So I often talk to a lot of athletes that come to our campus, football players, basketball players, et cetera, and their dreams and their thoughts are that next level is going to be the NBA or the NFL. Uh, if you look at the numbers, the vast majority don't get there. And so I, what I tell them to do is this. What you need to do is make sure you take full advantage of this scholarship that you have over the next four years so that when your playing days are done, if you don't make it to the next level, you will have a four-year degree in hand, and you can go straight to a middle income level status immediately. 
and you can have a job that you can sustain that level. That's the important thing. We see families that are in and out of you know, middle income and high income levels, but a year later they're below uh, that level real quickly because they didn't do it in the right way. So education helps you to get that sustainable type of a lifestyle that you can maintain over a long, a long period of time. Okay, thank you. questions a little bit more to what's going on right now uh, with budget cuts. I mean, we're hearing a lot um, out on the street, we're reading it in, in, in media, we're hearing it uh, from our friends about the budget cuts. Um, and we're seeing both K-12 um, on the chopping block as well as higher ed. Um, and knowing that education is that ticket to a better life and seeing that the budget cuts are, are, are in all likelihood, some of them are going are to become real. Um, my question to you is, knowing how important it is for children to start school ready to learn, uh, knowing how important it is for people to graduate on time uh, from school, knowing the supports that people need, um, especially those folks that are living in poverty, the extra supports that are needed to help um, individuals who are coming from um, I guess economically stressed homes to be able to stick with it. Um, what is it that you think we can do collectively as a community to help support the efforts of professional education and our educational system? So, Dr. Louis, since you just have the mic, we'll go first. Uh, and we actually talk a lot about this right now. Yeah. In the news, what you're hearing right now is a lot of cuts to higher education. And we've actually had to sustain a lot of cuts over the last eight years. Uh, about eight years ago, folks, uh, about 75% of our funding for higher education uh, was coming from the state of Louisiana. Now that has been cut down from 75% to 25%, okay? So what has happened in that meantime is you've seen tuition and cost of education going up and up and up every year and making that dream of a higher education not attainable for a lot of our students. Another thing we're facing right now as well, as you, I know you've heard that as well, is the cut to TOPS program. Mm -hmm. You know, the TOPS program began back, actually the beginning of the TOPS was the Taylor plans, if y'all remember that. This was back in the early 90s when Patrick Taylor uh, made a contact with students out of inner city New Orleans. Uh, and what he was reaching out to was those students that were just barely making a B maybe, but they showed promise to do well in college, okay? And the, the pact with them was this, if you take the right class while you're in high school and you earn at least a B average, a 2.5 average, and if your in family income is no more than $75,000, I'm gonna supplement with, with the, the Pell Grant that you'll be receiving when you go to college with this, uh, this Taylor Plan scholarship so that one, you can go to college, college is doable for you, and two, you won't have to leave college with a lot of loan debt to hand. All right. So what we're now hearing in Baton Rouge is the students that this program was intended for, that is probably going to be taken away from them. Uh, they're talking about making uh, the requirements for the TOPS program, uh, increasing the requirements of it significantly, which in turn with these students with 2.5s and the, the 20 ACT scores would be removed from consideration from that. So my cry out to the community is this, please, Talk to your legislators. Let them know two things they want them to support. And one is continue to support the Louisiana TOPS program because it keeps really our bright students, the students that are our future, it keeps them in Louisiana pursuing post-secondary education. But on the second thing I ask uh, y'all to do as well is ask them also to continue to support higher education. Because even if we have the TOPS program and funding for higher education is diminished, then the costs keep rising, okay? And therefore, the top program and the federal financial aid program are not enough for these students to even pursue post-secondary education. All right, and I, I got my notice from Susanna that we have five minutes left total, so you two have got to split the five minutes. So. Okay, uh, I would like to uh, address the question that, uh, speaking to, from the perspective of a local district superintendent, just yesterday, I learned that a uh, budget uh, that I had uh, anticipated having 350000 it was reduced by 150000 So, uh, and I'd already paid out uh, the uh, supplement that uh, was more or less mandated by law. Uh, however, the response to it will, uh, at some point in time, and we are, uh, we have a uh, solid uh, budget within the, the school system, but I am concerned that if we move 
work or what have you. And certainly we, we don't want to do this. Um, but again, I have to say the response is uh, having those uh, discussions with our legislators. I certainly am a supporter of TOPS. Do I believe that TOPS should be reformed? I do in the sense that our students need to be responsible. If they're going to take advantage of the uh, financial opportunity, then they need to be held accountable. If they don't finish the program, then they, there should be a stipulation that they take, pay back the money. Um, again, we need to be uh, accountable, and as we move forward uh, with um, the discussions regarding finances, we just have to continue to work with our business community. I just had a discussion with a principal who wrote four grant proposals. Uh, he was able to secure money to help uh, the freight costs as it relates to um, the various tests that are taken. Uh, today, um, and uh, we're, we're just going to have to think outside of the box, be creative, and do more with less, unless we, under we recognize the uh, physical condition of the state. This didn't happen overnight. Uh, pointing the finger or playing the blame game doesn't help us. We have to think of ways in which to uh, make great things happen within our schools and within our school systems, and that's what we're doing. I've had conversations with but we all recognize, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> we all recognize that um, the cuts are not good for, for improving student outcomes. Right. <laughs> Dr. Smith, we'll let you kind of wrap it up real quick. So what, what is, it? is there anything that we can do as a community besides advocating? Do you have some other thoughts? Well, we both are coming to me from a great faithful argument. But we do need to have some people from the community. The word talks about all oh, this is in a proposed cut of K through 12 and higher education. We need to hold them accountable. Mm -hmm. we look at, this is a policy summary, right? Yes. How do we get out of the policy? Okay. Okay. How do we cut education? Okay. Why would anyone propose sincerely to cut education okay. in Louisiana when we're in the top five of being the high poverty state? Okay. Okay. It's simple. They can tell you all the things about top. And all of them. We need to do it. We need to do it. We need to do it. Diversity community because it's a big white and black community. They start working together on how we want our state, what we want our hospitals to look like, what we want our kids to go to band to add to that, give them a few more minutes here. <laughs> if we're going to hold this thing to we need to be held to too in our community to make sure that we support our mothers out there with young age kids and not being educated. And the last question about a way to imagine that we have to be able to invest in changing training, we have to be invest. Zero to five. We have to build our foundation. If you build a house today, if you build a house that over your grass, over the town, we're all going to see things and roads and all kinds of things going to see things. Because we have to build a foundation. Our foundation is our key. Our foundation, we must develop early age, early college, early age education for our kids. Or if it's a motion we give it to our here, they'll say the same arguments over and over about finger pointing and whatever. We got to hold our folks accountable. Education is too important to our community. To me, it's a word to you. So that's what I'm saying. Wow. Okay, well, on that note, we're going to bring this panel to a close. Uh, too short, really. We need more than 30 minutes to dive into these topics. But I want to thank our panelists. Y'all did a great job of the first group up. And uh, we really thank you for your comments and the time that you took today to prepare for this, uh, this meeting. So thank you again.